Canto 27 is quite a momentous canto in the purgatory. It's the one where Dante finally passes through the fire. Remember the fire that he'd anticipated in his dream that's been haunting him all along. But the final part of the purgatory that will bring his will into alignment with his love. So enabling him to embark on the next stage of the journey, which is about the dramatic expansion of his sight. But it terrifies him. This is the kind of fire which I guess in the medieval mind would be likened to the fire that might purify the metal, that it burns away the dross that which is unnecessary and, as it were, aligns the very steel to its sole purpose, maybe of being a blade, and so enables it to reach all its potential to be actualized as Dante, the human soul, can bring together all the aspects of himself Remember, we'd heard about how the soul is created and then breathed in by God. All that potential is going to finally come together. But unlike many of the other fears and terrors that Dante has faced, in a way, with this one, he has more choice than any other. You know, when he'd been led by Virgil through the Inferno, he didn't really know what he was facing. Um, he came across the giants, he came across the demons, he came across the horrific scenes and was led through them, not quite knowing what was going on. But in a way now he does know what's going on. A lot has changed for him as he has climbed up through Mount Purgatory. He's heard a lot about love in particular. He's seen a lot about the complications of his own love life and in the last canto in particular, has seen by gazing at the souls already in the fire, quite what it takes. And so now as he comes to the flames, he really does have perhaps more of a choice than any other moment in the Divine Comedy. I think he really can turn away if his fear would overcome him. So there's something really in st at stake in this canto. It's not at all a foregone conclusion and in many ways that is a profound spiritual truth that the higher we climb the more in some ways is at stake. The more chance there is to at least get stuck on this terrace if he can't find it within him how to enter the flames. It's also as Dante the Poet begins this canto, quite close to the end of the day, he describes how the sun is beginning to set in the sky. Um, he uses one of his lovely cosmic ways of describing the end of the day, referring to four points across the earthly globe, signalling as well that this is the time of the day when Jesus's blood was spilled in Jerusalem. It's a kind of appropriate thing to remember um, because this has been a set of cantos about the body, about the blood, the lifeblood, the heat and the moisture, the coming together of all that's good on earth which was shared by Jesus as he was going through his own passion which Dante must do now. And as the sun is setting, they hear an angel. Another angel appears to them, and this one sings, Blessed are the pure in heart. Pure here meaning having focus, having the right intensity, having the purpose of will to undergo this final step. Remember, this is what Dante had seen when he gazed at the souls in the flames. Um, when they had been marching along with their desire, able to utilise their desire, particularly their erotic love, in ways that 
hadn't been possible for the souls who were trapped in hell. And this angel is reminding Dante that, in a way, that's his choice. Is he going to be like Francesca and Paolo, who he'd seen in hell, just caught up in epicycles of their erotic desire? Or is he going to be like the pure in heart, those who are focused, those who can step into the flames, knowing what it's going to take, knowing what it's like to have all that erotic intensity focused, burnt away, in order to release the desire that can propel him towards the next stages of the ascent. The angel offers Dante a word of comfort. It says, don't be deaf to what you can hear from the other side, from the other side of the flames. But Dante is at first immobile and fixed with fear. And in some ways you have some sympathy for him because of course he has got his body of flesh. He's not like the other souls with their aerial bodies. Perhaps they're more transparent to the flames. Perhaps there's something less at risk for them when they enter the flames. And Dante isn't sure. He's seen people burn on earth. He himself was condemned to burn if he would return to Florence. He's heard the church say that those burning flames are purifying. Maybe this is a last hideous echo of the way the church gets things so wrong that holds him back here now. Can he trust what he's learnt in paradise, what he's hearing from the angel, what Virgil starts to encourage him with? Because Virgil says, look, test the flames. And Dante puts his hand towards the flames as he's sort of feeling the heat. Um, Dante says, hold part of your garment towards them, and I promise you that even if you lasted a thousand years in the flames, not one bit of that garment would be burnt. It's not that kind of flame. It's a flame that is at once less terrifying to the pure flesh, you might say, but that also, in a way, makes it all the more penetrating because it's going to work on the deepest recesses of his soul. Dante can't quite yet do it. He's now ashamed. You know, maybe he's thinking what will be exposed by these flames, what will be in effect shouted from the rooftops, what secrets of his heart will be now known in this burning away, in this surfacing of the dross as the steel behind is purified. This is a man whose whole life has been shaped by all the different varieties of lust and love and erotic desire. Virgil is now getting a bit annoyed, Dante the poet tells us, and produces the trump card of citing Beatrice's name. Don't you know, he says, that just this wall is now all that keeps you from seeing her? And that does it. You might say that going back to the origin, the first stirring and awakening of his love that has brought him thus far, is what does it for Dante. He describes it in quite an interesting way. He describes his final conversion, his choice made, his will stepping out by referring to uh, ancient myth of Pyramus and Thisbe. They were two earthly lovers who couldn't meet in life and through the ups and downs of the story finally only meet in death. And I wonder if this is saying that Dante realises that he can shed his body of flesh, he can die in order to embrace the love which lies on the other side of the flames. Um, he can undergo that step change in order to step into a new life on the other side of death. You know, a bit like the philosophers who've been intimated in the previous canto who made dying their care because they realise that by letting go what you might call the little loves in life, intense and enticing though they are, this actually only opens up onto more and more love. 
which will provide um, the fullness of sight and perception and satisfaction. He sees a kind of purity of heart that he can occupy. Um, it's said that he changes his mind like a child who's been given an apple, an apple from Eden, you might say. He has gained that childish state of mind that's not naive, um, but has a kind of clarity. Um, remember, we'd heard that children, when they're first born, just delight in all that's around them. And Dante manages to find that position within himself now, and so steps into the flames. Virgil goes first, leading him to encourage him, then Dante, and Virgil asks Statius to follow them behind. He's got plenty of support, even as he goes through this powerful process, and he says that he would have rather stepped into boiling glass in order to find some relief. That was how intense it was. It requires his all. Every part of him now is engaged in this transformation. Little wonder it burns. Virgil encourages him in an interesting way for Virgil, because Virgil says, I think I can see Beatrice's eyes in order at one level to encourage Dante. But it's very striking that Virgil thinks he can see the eyes of Beatrice in paradise as well. I think this is indicative of where he's at in relation to salvation, purgation and his own journey. They hear another angel singing from the other side of the flames, encouraging them on singing, come into my father's kingdom, which is what Jesus had promised his disciples. And they make it through. They step out onto the other side. Dante sees the angel that had been singing. Its radiance fills him intently. But the angel also says to them, look, make haste. There's not much daylight left. Remember now, even in this newly born state, they must rest by night. And so, and so they make their way through the passageway, cut in the rock, ascending directly up the mountain. Immediately they fall into shade and then they realise that the sun has indeed set and they're going to have to make their beds for the night. And there's a kind of peaceful pastoral scene. Dante says he sees the vast expanse of the sky and the final colours of the day being taken by the night. And he describes how they're like goats and a shepherd with Interestingly, both Virgil and Statius described as Dante's shepherds, and they take a step each on the mountainside and lie down for the night. It's one of the truly lovely, quiet scenes in the purgatory, caught particularly well, I think, in one of Blake's best illustrations of the Divine Comedy with the large moon and the bright stars seen all the more intently and vividly. Dante says they seem larger than he ever noticed them before because he's seen more of them, more than just their physical light. He, without half realising, I think, having passed through the fire, can already see so much more of the spiritual light that's round about him. And he falls asleep and it must have been a very deep and restful sleep for this third night on Mount Purgatory, because before we know what's happened, we're being told that Venus is rising in the morning sky. She's the morning star, that star of diamonds like love. And Dante's having his third dream. And he dreams that he sees a woman walking through a meadow picking flowers, she's going to make them into a garland, and she says that she's Leah, the wife of Jacob, and that her sister, the second wife of Jacob, Rachel, is also there. And whilst Leah is looking into a mirror to see the beautiful thing she's made, Rachel is looking into another mirror, into her very soul, through her very eyes, contemplating who she is in herself. And this simple dream now, 
untroubling dream for Dante. He says is going to foretell what he's going to encounter next. It's one of these precognitive dreams um, that seem to be associated with the early morning. So his sight is already seeing into the future um, more directly than he has done before. That will come in the next canto, what these two figures of Rachel and Leia, Leia represent. But perhaps here they also represent for him that these two dynamics within himself are now fully actualised. They are the love that loves life, that as it were goes through the meadow, picking the flowers, making beautiful things, but also the love that loves just to contemplate life, the love that can look into itself and see nothing but beauty, as Rachel represents. Very different dream now from the first dream in Purgatory where Dante had seen into himself and seen the abduction of the boy Ganymede by the eagle as they flew into the flames in the high heavens. He's now passed through that flame and so sees himself now in a very, very different light. One whose action and whose contemplation can both tolerate what it sees and love what it sees as well. Then Dante wakes up refreshed. Remember before the dreams had become nightmares and awoken to him trouble, but now he wakes with the morning light and Virgil is there once again to tell him that today is going to be the day when you receive the apple that's going to satisfy everything that this has been about. There's not going to be another night in the Divine Comedy. So it's not that everything is going to be, as it were, speedily wrapped up, but now he's moving into the eternal daylight. And so that's why he's in at the dawn of this new everlasting day and all that it's going to bring. Little wonder that Dante is full of levity and lightness. He feels his wings taking flight. And so they move with great ease up the rest of the steps. And then Virgil turns to address Dante and in these momentous famous words he describes for Dante where he's got to. It's going to be the last words that Virgil says to Dante. Again I think it's significant for Virgil's own story which we don't know the completion of by Dante's account but that he offers his final thoughts all in the service of Dante. That is the act of a soul whose purgation is far underway. And he tells Dante that he's seen it all now before he steps into paradise. He's seen the temporal fire here on purgatory. He's seen the timeless or eternal fire of the inferno where there's no day or light. He now knows if he looks within himself, perhaps as he's just seen in the dream, that his will and his desire, his love, is refined. That whatever it chooses, it now can't really go wrong. He doesn't need Virgil or Statius's guidance anymore. He can, in the words of Augustine, love and do what he wills. It can't ultimately lead him astray anymore. Virgil says to Dante, look where we've arrived at the borders of Eden, look at the grass and the trees and the flowers. Begin to sense that this is a very different place, Virgil says. It's where these plants have a kind of inner life and vitality of their own. They've got a different supernatural quality. They're transformed a new creation too. Virgil says, you can sit or wander as you will, until the eyes that you've been longing to see find you and come and greet you. And you no longer need my guidance, Virgil says, and in the concluding line of this canto says that he crowns and mitres Dante as lord of himself. Dante now no longer needs Virgil's guidance, he no longer needs the guidance of the secular authorities, maybe the pagan philosophers and poets. He no longer needs the guidance of the bishops, the popes, the church. 
all that is now gathered into himself, become part of himself, he understands it, he sees it, he's transcended it. He can leave behind those temporal authorities as he waits right on the edge of Eden to, for those eyes that he has been so longing to see. It's not going to go quite as he expects still, but nonetheless, he can follow his love and find a way through, as we'll find out in the next canto.